always was something I grew up with. Uh, at night at our dinner table, we used to have little quizzes, uh, and everybody had to be able to tell at least one little piece of news they'd, they'd heard that day, or they had to say a new word. So we learned very young that, uh, that news and words and, and information was really very important. Hi, I'm Jamie Quinn. Welcome to One on One. Today's episode is all about making news. Stay with us because coming up, I'll be sitting down with a woman whose work reaches over 180,000 households a week. She's actively involved in her community, and her name has appeared in one local paper for close to 25 years. Stay tuned. I'll be talking with the editor-in-chief for the Mississauga News, Judy Emerson. She's the woman in charge of deciding what gets printed in a paper that reaches thousands each day. Welcome, Judy Emerson. Thanks, Jamie. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Now, I know you started with the Mississauga News in the early 80s in 1981 back then, a reporter. Now you're almost running the show in terms of the new news content. Uh, how did you, or did you rather, ever picture yourself in such a high position? Oh, never, certainly never pictured myself here. Uh, running the show may be a bit of a stretch. My publisher may have something to say about that, but <laughs> uh, actually he doesn't interfere very much at all. It's been uh, a, a tremendous 25 years. Uh, it really has been. We've uh, gone from being a typical small town newspaper with banks and people rolling paper onto uh, pieces of other paper to be made into film to a newspaper where we don't even use cameras anymore, Dig we only use digital cameras, we have no dark room, uh, and everybody uses a computer. The old typewriter days are gone. Now what was your vision of your career when you were a little bit younger, uh, growing up? Did you think you'd go into journalism? No, actually I had no intention of going into journalism. I was going to be a legal secretary. I thought being a legal secretary was just the best thing in the world to do, and that way I'd get to marry a lawyer. So. <laughs> That was my mother's idea. Um, so I really had no intention of doing this until uh, um, I was actually an adult and uh, was returning to school full time and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Now I know you actually dropped out of high school at age 17 and uh, really bounced back after that. Uh, you mm -hmm. got married, mm -hmm. had a child, and at what age did you actually get back and, and finish that up? Well, I had three children before I went back to school, so I was 23 when I finally went back to school full-time. I had always gone to school part-time uh, from the time I'd left. Uh, you know, in between changing diapers and uh, making meals, I was going to school to finish high school and then to go to college. And you attended Humber College in the journalism program there? Yes, I did for three years. And what exactly did you want to do when you were at, in Humber College? Did you have dreams of being a reporter, which you actually did? Oh yeah, that's definitely what I wanted to do at that point. And as a matter of fact, where I really wanted to work was at the Mississauga News. I thought that that would be a great opportunity for me. I was a, a mom who lived close by. And I thought that was the perfect opportunity. And uh, I w did a little bit of uh, freelance work for them. And one day they called me at school and uh, said, when you're finished, would you like a job? Really? And I said yes. <laughs> now that doesn't happen much anymore, does it? Not very often. No. no. As a matter of fact, just last week I was cleaning out some old things in my closet and I found the note that the editor uh, had sent to me at Humber asking me if I wanted a job. So I figure as long as I keep that note, I'll keep my job. Fantastic. And what about the first story you ever wrote? Do you remember that or the first story that was published? The very first story that was published was a story about the Salvation Army moving into uh, new quarters in Aaron Mills. And I dealt with a fellow named Paul Zabo, who is uh, now uh, an MP for Mississauga South. He was my contact and uh, my lead on the story. I still remember they had uh, the congregation had been working in the basement uh, of a church, and now they had their own new quarters. And my lead was they've moved a step closer to God. So that was my first story. <laughs> I don't think you ever forget the first one. And now you're very involved in the community as well. You're working for a local paper. Uh, do you think your upbringing and the way you were raised had anything to do with the path you've chosen? Uh, my dad actually was a, a bit of a journalist. Uh, he did some freelance, mostly involving sports. He did some sports writing. He was a car racer, and he did some of that. So reading was something, uh, and news was something I grew up with. Uh, at night at our dinner table, we used to have little quizzes, uh, and everybody had to be able to tell at least one little piece of news they'd, they'd heard that day, or they had to say a new word. 
So we learned very young that, that news and words and, and information was really very important. Wow. And how many siblings did you have? Well, that's a long story. <laughs> we started out with a lot of them. Um, we were a, a working class family, uh, fairly modest means, and there were originally six of us, and there are now three. Growing up in a working class family could have something to do with your very, very strong work ethic. Would you say that's correct? Oh, oh, I'm quite sure. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my mom was one of the strongest people I ever met in my life. And, uh, she didn't work outside the home, but she certainly ran the home very well, and and uh, with an iron fist, and and nothing ever got in her way. It, it didn't matter what happened to her or how she felt. She always, always carried on. Um, and and that I think she passed along to me. My dad was my dad was more of the dreamer. My dad taught me to be an adventure seeker, and and he taught me to dream and he taught me to want to do crazy things that uh, my mom didn't always think I should do. <laughs> like parachuting? I've heard you've done that. Like parachuting <laughs> and auto racing and, you know, bungee jumping and, you know, one of my greatest, greatest days actually was flying with the snowbirds, which was kind of neat. I want you to know I was the only person who came back with an empty bag. <laughs> oh, so you weren't sick. I was not sick. Now, right now you are still nitpicky about words and uh, I've read that your biggest pet peeve, I would say, would be incorrect grammar and that sort of thing. And um, well, now you're managing staff, a staff of reporters that are writing. And how do you think they see you? As a bit of an ogre sometimes. <laughs> uh, I'm known as a bit of a grammar queen. Not so much the way it, it's spoken. Uh, there's an old phrase, uh, it, it ain't writ as it spoke. And, and I believe that when we write English, I think it's really important to make sure that it's written properly, grammatically correct with syntax in place and you know, dangling modifiers and none of those things that people often don't even realize are there. They just don't know it. They haven't been taught it. Um, there's, there's a bit of a constant struggle between between my staff and I who prefer a little more casual language, more of the more popular lexicon, and, and I'm more a little more rigid and more likely to stick to a proper language. And so in the end, the paper is pretty much sticking to the way you'd like it done? Unless I don't see it. <laughs> okay. It's hard to read every story before it goes in the paper. And why is it that you've decided you would like to stick to those traditions? I think it's really important um, for a couple of reasons in Mississauga. One is an awful lot of our population has English as a second language. And unless we're using good and proper grammar, it's very difficult for them to decipher it. Uh, we had a, a phrase not very long ago in one of our uh, stories, and it was hit the sack. And I questioned the reporter and said, if you were a new immigrant just learning to speak English, how would you translate that phrase, hit the sack? So I think it's important for those reasons. It's also important just as a teaching tool for our children. If they read newspapers every day, and we hope they'll all grow up to read papers every day, uh, if they're reading incorrect grammar, then that will likely be what they learn to do as well. So it's for two reasons. And how responsible do you feel for the credibility of the newspaper? Oh, entirely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, very, very long time ago, I heard uh, um, a psychiatrist speak, or a psychologist, and his name was Dr. Michael Durst, and he talked about uh, a rather odd concept about everybody having 100% responsibility. And it's, it's a concept that's fairly well ingrained at the Mississauga News, and, and most people take responsibility for everything they do, and they take more responsibility than that. It's, uh, I feel very, very responsible for what happens there, not just for the content of the news, but for the reputation of the newspaper and, and the health and, and safety and well-being of the staff, too. And how many staff do you have reporting to you? Fifteen reporting to me. And how has uh, the Mississauga News grown in the last 25 years since you've been there? Well, in some ways it's grown a lot, and in other ways it, it's uh, a little smaller than it used to be. We don't have as many staff as we used to. When I started at the Mississauga News, we had a staff of 24 in the editorial department, and we had an entire composing wow. room. Uh, now we have a staff, including me, of 15, and no composing room, so we do all of our own layout, and, and uh, everything has changed a lot. However, the size of the paper has grown tremendously. It, it, back then it was going to about 70,000 households, and now it goes to 180,000 households. You are a managing editor-in-chief as well, uh, but you are still involved in writing, and I know that I often do see your name on the, top, the bylines mm -hmm. of those articles as well. Uh, is that something you've made a point of doing? I love to write. If I could do just one thing for the rest of my life, I'd write. Uh, it's probably my greatest strength, 
and it's what comes most naturally to me. I have to struggle a little bit with the administrative side, but, uh, but writing is, is my first love, and um, I do that for the sheer pleasure of it. I love to write editorials. Um, my family and friends tell me that that's because I'm a little bossy and like to tell people what to do, but I, I just genuinely like to write. Would you call yourself a workaholic? Ah, I think I come dangerously close. Uh, certainly uh, my family thinks I am, and a lot of my friends think I am. So, But they're on the same boat. They tend to have the same work ethic I do. Now, your children are grown for the yes, most part, uh, but you did spend many years of your life as a single mom to four children. Yes. How is that like uh, as a professional as well? What was it like for you? It was a little crazy, actually. Uh, I can remember being at school and having one of our instructors say, you know, this is really easy now, guys. You're in school. All you have to do is have homework. And, and once you get out in the real world, it's going to be so much tougher. And at the time, I thought, when I get out in the real world, it's going to be a breeze. I mean, right now, I'm at school full time doing homework. I'm volunteering. I had three young children at home at the time. My fourth was adopted much later. Uh, and it, it was kind of crazy. So when I actually started working, it seemed to ease up just a little bit. But there are a lot of late nights and a lot of uh, weekend work and uh, a lot of things that not everybody thinks of as actual work, you know, a lot of dinners and events. And, and people think that those are just fun things to do, and they are. But uh, you're always on. You're always networking. You always have to be talking to people and, and uh, acting as an ambassador for the newspaper. Mm. Definitely not a nine to five job. Oh gosh, no, no, and that works very well in, in my favor. It, it really does. As a single mom, it was great. It meant if I had a dentist appointment, I could take off and do that. It, it's also a job that's so filled with new information and new people every day. It, it's never ever boring. I have never once had a day where I really didn't want to come to work, and not many people can say that after 23 years. I know that you're home life may have been particularly taxing because you're also you have a child who uh, has a disability yes. and um, were there any challenges on in that area where you felt maybe I can't do both? I uh, never thought that I couldn't do both. Um, it was always challenging. Um, I, we could spend three shows talking about the challenges associated with having a child with a um, a disability, particularly one who has a dual diagnosis of intellectual delay and mental illness, uh, so he has some very, very special needs. It's been tough on occasion. He requires a lot of care. He can't be left alone, uh, but he's enriched our lives in ways that, that uh, nobody ever could. He's made us much more compassionate people. And uh, you're also an advocate of human rights for the disabled as well, and, and tell me about some of the work you've done in that area. Well, I've been involved, uh, oddly, uh, maybe not so oddly, um, through community living for since my son was born, actually. So about 25 years, I've been a volunteer for them. I've sat on every committee they've had. I've been on, on their board of directors. I've done fundraising for them. I've been a speaker for them. Uh, and I, I, I have a lot of friends who have disabilities because I, a lot of people with disabilities are very lonely. And uh, I think people are just sometimes awkward about how to deal with them. Uh, they're so easy to please. They just want you to spend time with them and, and be their friends. So um, I, I have a lot of a number of friends who have disabilities who have uh, gotten to know me in, in an entirely different way than the people I work with would. Let's talk about the Christmas fund. I know that's something uh, that you're also very involved in. What exactly is that? Uh, Christmas Fund is a great organization uh, that's operated by the Mississauga News, actually, in much the same way that the Santa Claus Fund is operated by the Toronto Star. Uh, we absorb all of the administrative costs, and the time that we spend on it is time that, that our publisher, Ron Lennick, gives us uh, free time to do. So um, in addition to some of the night stuff, if we need time off during the day, we do that. Over the years, we've helped thousands and thousands uh, of children in Mississauga and their families uh, by providing Christmases for them when they would otherwise have none. We also were involved with Breakfast with Santa, uh, which is just a fabulous program. We have um, some of the most needy children in the community who, who come to these breakfasts. And in some cases, they're so needy, they I mean, they're part of breakfast programs every day, which is where we get their names. Do you think a newspaper has a responsibility to promote or uh, become involved in these community-based organizations? 
you know, it's a tough call, and people feel very differently about it. There are some people who believe that, that you should have absolutely no involvement at all. And I think, as a reporter, that's probably very true. You can't be very involved because you are, you're making decisions about stories all the time. As an editor, you're a little more removed uh, from, from the day-to-day -day operation and, and from writing leads and, you know, covering which stories get covered. A little more removed, and, and it, it's much, much easier. I think as a newspaper, we have a tremendous responsibility to our community, not just to cover their events and, or to act as a community booster and support, but uh, to, to assist residents uh, individually and organizations when we can. Do you think the media does play a role in facilitating change, or, or do you think it should? I think, uh, I think ideally it would, and I think ideally all the change that we affect would be positive. I'm not so sure that's always the case. Um, the GTA, for example, was the brainchild of the Toronto Star years and years before it ever came into existence, and, and they pushed for that model for a long time. Now, some would argue now that maybe that wasn't such a great idea, but it was through their pushing and their, their initiatives that, that the GTA eventually came about. I think people do pay a lot of attention, um, certainly around big issues, uh, they, around elections, for example. For the most part, people turn to their newspapers, and, and very much so to their community newspaper, to find out what's going on in their own backyard. In terms of elections, sometimes that can be a sticky issue, mm -hmm. um, how the paper decides to cover an election and fair coverage mm -hmm. of election issues. And uh, have you ever run into trouble where you know, people are complaining at the way you, you've done that, and uh, how have you reacted to that? Oh, every year, every election, <laughs> people complain about those things. It depends whether you're the winner or the loser, whether or not you complain. We, we differentiate a little bit the way uh, we uh, cover elections. Unlike most of the dailies, we don't uh, have a particular Tory uh, or grit bent or, or a socialist bent. We really believe that we should uh, endorse people, local citizens, who can do the best job locally for us. Other than elections, how do you decide what gets printed or what stories you'll cover and which ones you won't cover? News judgment's very arbitrary. It, uh, there are days when, uh, you know, the, the smallest things, most insignificant news stories can make it onto the front page. Uh, last week was an example of that. Uh, practically everything in the city's been closed down for a while. Uh, it's the middle of summer, dog days of summer, nobody wants to be around. Digging up stories in those days uh, are, are tough. Uh, however, <laughs> when things get back into full swing, uh, trying to find space to fit in all the stories is, is virtually impossible. You couldn't do it. And in that case, that's when we exercise judgment. Um, based on some significant criteria, you know, how important is the story? How many people w will it affect? I mean, one individual could have a great story. If it has absolutely no impact on other people, it's probably not as important, even if it's a life or death situation for that individual. So it's a balance of interest and uh, a balance of, of how it will actually affect people. Do you feel powerful in that you're deciding what news makes it to people's doorsteps? Actually, I feel anything but powerful. For the most part, I feel like an instrument of the people who live in Mississauga. Uh, they call me. They're the ones with the stories. Uh, they're the ones who are making things happen. I'm just the one who facilitates their information being made available to the public. So, so no, it's r the, the slave master role is a little reversed, I think. Do you feel like uh, you are a success? Have you been successful? Uh, I, I don't know. In, in terms of success, um, I can't just look at a job to make me successful. Um, I have a wonderful, wonderful family, and, and uh, I'm blessed with really good friends, a uh, job I love and, and want to come to every day, and, and a boss who's been incredibly supportive and uh, stays out of the newsroom most of the time, which is a great thing for a publisher to do. Does bad news ever get you down? Oh, sure. Yeah, all the time. Um, I, uh, my heart bleeds sometimes at some of the stories I hear, uh, some of the things people have to put up with. And, and the lives they faced every day. It makes me grateful for the life I have. Um, bad times at home, you try not to bring them to work, but uh, you know, sometimes you do. Certainly I did a couple of years ago, and in the space of a couple of years, I, I lost uh, my mom, my dad, my brother, uh, my ability to drive, <laughs> and, and a number of other things. And, and that, I'm sure that showed, that had an effect. And your ability to drive, that has to do with the fact that you're losing your sight, is that correct? Yes, yes, I am.
Which would make it a little difficult for you to uh, read all day, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it does, actually. Again, I have to be very thankful to my boss. He provides everything I need. Any, any extra assistive device that's necessary is there, just like that. All I have to do is say I need it, and he gets it for me. So technology playing a part in helping you work? Plays a huge role in how I work. Uh, the computer screen I have on my desk is bigger than most people's TVs. So, <laughs> What changes have you seen in the print news media over the last, say, 15, 20 years? In Mississauga, our population has grown so much. Um, a rise in population, a rise in crime, um, and what has that meant for the work that you do? A lot of our stories now are, are a lot more negative in tone than they used to be. There's no question about that. Things that happen now in the city just weren't around uh, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I know when my children were born, it was very common practice to put them in, in a carriage and, and leave them outside on the front porch to get a little fresh air. Uh, and nobody thought anything about it. Well, now, you know, people walk their 10-year-old children to the school bus every day because they're afraid. Things like murders and rapes and, and uh, gang fights were things that, that were not very prevalent uh, back in when I first started at the news. Now there's much more of that. You hear a lot more about street, street racing and, and attacks and assaults than we ever did before. Some of that is just pure reflection of the numbers we have here. We're a city of almost 700,000 people, bound to be a little more crime than when we were a city of, of 150,000. So uh, things have, have changed quite a bit. Predominantly, technology has changed the way we cover news, though, and that's been a huge, huge difference. When I started at the news, I had a little old Underwood, you know, that clicked and clacked and made a lot of noise. And actually, the newsroom then was kind of fun. It sounded like a newsroom. You walked in and you heard all kinds of noise and, and people yelling on the telephone. And, and now, for the most part, it's pretty quiet because people are using their computers. They're, they're conversing most of the time through email and, and picking up voicemails. And where do you see the news business, the local newspaper business, let's say, moving towards in the next 10 to 15 years? Do you see another change on its way? Oh, I think change is constant in, in this business, uh, certainly now anyway. The advent of online newspapers, uh, web papers, has, has been huge. It's had quite an impact, but the one thing we know is that nobody's likely to take their computer into the bathroom with them, and they will still take the newspapers. So uh, I, I don't think we'll ever see the death of the paper. Uh, I do see it being phased out and, and being used differently and maybe being presented differently, but I think people will always want news. It's an age-old institution. You know, 3000 BC, they were carving it out on tablets because people wanted to know. I don't imagine they'll lose that desire anytime soon. Would you call yourself a news junkie? Oh, you bet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a news junkie, a political junkie, a people junkie. Now, when was it that you first started losing your vision? I've actually known I've been going to lose my vision since I was about seven years old. It's a hereditary disease. Uh, my dad had it, and my son has the same affliction. It's um, commonly known as macular degeneration, and but the version we have is an early onset and inherited form of it called BESTS, rather ironically. <laughs> and uh, they took my license three years ago. Your driver's license? Yes. Okay. My doctor took it right in her office. <laughs> oh, gosh. And how does that affect your job? Uh, it has affected it a little. Most of my appointments come to see me now. Um, I rely very heavily on my reporters and photographers. If I'm going out to events, I go with them. And uh, again, my boss, who is one of the most wonderful people in the world to work for, um, has given me a cab allowance so that I can take taxis anywhere I have to go. So. And let's talk about reading. How long can you read in a day? And I know to read, you actually have to use some pretty sophisticated technology. Mm -hmm. um, but does that cut down on the number of hours you can actually read in a day? It cuts down on what I read for pleasure, unfortunately, okay. uh, because that is sort of what gets left behind. You do the work stuff first because you have to do that, and uh, sometimes by the end of the day your eyes are just too tired. I have uh, little gizmos and, con and contraptions all over the house. Uh, I have magnifying glass in every room and, and glasses on every surface, you know, on my desk, in the bathroom, in my bedroom. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm often seeing reading with my glasses on and a magnifying glass in front of me. So, it takes a little work. And will it progress and become worse? It will. It will progress and, and eventually uh, I won't be able to do my job, but that's not likely to happen for the next five years or so anyway. I will never be completely blind. It will never be profound. I will mm -hmm. always be able to see. Um, 
um, I just will not uh, be able to uh, read necessarily or, or identify you un until you're pretty close to me. Hmm. And have you thought of what you'll do in, in five years then? Then I'll dictate the great Canadian novel. <laughs> okay. Are you serious? I'm quite serious. Mm -hmm. And what would you like to write about? Oh, I don't know. What happened last weekend? What happens next weekend? I'm not sure what I'll write about. There's lots of life to write about. Fiction? Probably fiction, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's kind of a step away from what you've been doing. <laughs> very much so. Very much so, yeah. I try to keep the two very separate, actually. <laughs> try to keep as much fiction as possible out of the newspaper. What are your words that you live by? Uh, my secrets, my philosophies. Uh, my mom was a great philosopher, and she always had words of wisdom for just about everything that came up. Um, one of them was, uh, whatever gets you through the night, um, meaning, you know, you do what you have to do to make it through to the next day. Um, she always said that life was for the living. Actually, when she and my dad passed away, we were told we had two weeks to grieve. And uh, they said, otherwise, you might as well climb into the grave with us. Life is for the living, and you need to take as much as you can out of every day. And I really believe that. I try to live like that. Are your children an inspiration? Ah, they're more than an inspiration. They are uh, among my best friends, actually. My three oldest daughters um, have been a tremendous help to me with my son. They all have degrees in the humanities as social workers or psychiatrists, psychologists. They're all in the humanities. So they've been very, very helpful. But they're also my best friends. We, we do a lot together. And one of them has given me two absolutely perfect grandchildren. So... <laughs> So you don't mind being a grandma? Oh, no, it's great. Mm. I get to spoil them, feed them sugar, and send them home. <laughs> it's great. I never have to do laundry. I don't have to worry about babysitters. Fantastic. And they're delightful. That wraps up this week's episode of One on One. Thank you so much, Judy Emerson, for being with us today. It was my pleasure, Jamie. Thank you. And we'll see you next time.